Okay, this video is about opioids and um, what kind of problems they cause and how common it is. So first of all, I had a friend, he was a general surgeon, vascular surgeon, a lot older than me. He went for open heart surgery. It's called a cabbage coronary artery bypass graft. And he went home the next day because he's a surgeon. He knows what the post-operative uh, rehab is. And he didn't want to sit around the hospital putting himself at risk for deep vein thrombosis, DVT, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, those sort of things. Um, he would have been better off, of course, if he knew about you know, going vegan to prevent atherosclerosis in his coronaries. But still, the point is, no messing around with all this problems with pain pills and constipation. He just got himself home. I have an aunt who, you know, she's dead now, but when she was alive, she was a physician, very smart lady. She was 78 years old, fell down, broke her hip. First day post-operative, after she had her hip operated on, she pulls out her IVs, signs the paperwork, leaves the hospital against medical advice, AMA. And she said, they said, well, aren't you in pain? Don't you want pain medicine? She goes, I can deal with the pain. I just don't want to get a, a deep vein thrombosis, pneumonia, or anything, okay? And, you know, she had her relatives or daughter to take care of her, of course. But um, the point I'm making, again, the same mentality. Get the surgery that you need. Get home as fast as possible. A guy by the name of Maxwell Maltz, he's a physician and plastic surgeon. He wrote a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. Psycho meaning mind, cybernetics, to drive. That's like a Greek word. To drive your own mind, to be in control of your own life. His books, by the way, were very motivational. And they were read by all these top-notch national and world-class athletes back in the 1980s. Very inspiring. Um, there's a bunch of videos by Maxwell Maltz, MD, online. You can check them out. I like them. He's very get your mind into a positive attitude. Uh, kind of like reminds me of Brian Tracy. Um, he noticed that the patients that were goal-seeking, purpose-driven, did much better. Like if a patient said, I just need to get the surgery, then I got to get home as fast as possible, you know, for their kids or, you know, their husband, whatever it might be, they did great. Whereas the ones that were kind of unfocused, they would often sit around and everybody who's done a surgical internship or surgical residency sees a lot of this. I'm in pain, I'm in pain. And of course, you don't want the patient to be in pain, but some patients, they just focus so much on their pain, they won't get up and walk. They sit around in bed, then they get more and more constipated. They get more and more of a dilated ileus at their bowel. They're in pain. They don't walk. They get deep vein thrombosis clots in their leg veins. Sometimes they'll toss a pulmonary embolism. Sometimes just sitting around in bed, they'll get a pneumonia and they die, okay? Lousy outcomes. Um, I went for colonoscopy about 15 years ago because my mother had died of colon cancer. The guy who scoped me said my colon was so normal it wasn't even funny. It's his exact words to me. And uh, I did it with no sedation because I didn't want to inconvenience my relatives to give me a ride. Um, I was teased by some relatives saying, oh, I bet you enjoyed it. You know, why'd you do that? I said, no, the reason why I did it with no sedation is because I had read about potential risk of side effects causing uh, decreased memory. I didn't want to take that risk. There's some uh, anesthetic medicines, an IV anesthetics, that that's a potential side effect is a lingering uh, decrease in memory ability. No way was I going to take that chance. I haven't gone back for colonoscopy since. I don't intend to ever go back because my risk is so low. Why risk the potential side effects of it? Like a perforated colon, like bleeding from a biopsy site when I know there's like so low a risk it's not even funny. All right, so the way to think about pills is they're all potentially dangerous. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes you might need a pill. I've seen a lot of people have their life saved by intravenous infection, I, I, antibiotics with bad infections. And there's other indications where pills sometimes help. But in general, the purpose of a pill is to block an enzyme, okay? And they're potentially dangerous. You don't get healthy in general for a healthy person by blocking your body's enzymes. They're there for a reason. Um, and the reason I mentioned all this stuff about the people undergoing surgery or procedures is because a lot of people get started on opioids as treatment for pain after a procedure. And my advice would be avoid opioids as much as you possibly can. I mean, you might have a person with metastatic cancer who's sort of end stage going to hospice and maybe opioids, they're in a lot of pain, are reasonable in that setting. That sounds very reasonable. But to take opioids after more minor things, I think that's a terrible mistake. I've known top-notch doctors, you know, the best of the best, AOAs, top-notch. I've known top-notch technologists and other persons related to healthcare professions who have had children die from opioid overdose. It's common. It's really common. 
In 2019, about 50,000 Americans died from opioids. In 2020, 70,000 Americans died from opioids. In 2021, 75,000 died from opioids. That's a lot of people. Many of these were prescription opioids that led to abuse and subsequent accidental overdose. Okay? Uh, you know, heroin, morphine, fentanyl are some of the more common opioids. Fentanyl is especially dangerous, most common cause of overdose death in young adults. Um, opioid treatment, you can take methadone to minimize the side effects of withdrawal, or you can quit cold turkey. You know, I'm not an expert on opioids. I'm not involved in it clinically. I've seen plenty of patients on them, but I myself don't prescribe them. Um Here's a quote from Paradise Lost by John Milton. He lived in the 1600s, and he said, Long is the way and hard that out of hell leads up to light. Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. And I'm serious, man. Don't take this stuff, don't take this stuff lightly. One experimentation with opioids, you could be addicted dead real fast. It's, it's pretty serious stuff. Okay, here's a picture of a normal brain. We see the basal ganglia. Here's the internal capsule, anterior limb, posterior limb, shaped like a boomerang, caudate nucleus. These are the deep gray nuclei of the brain. This is at the basal ganglia level, thalamus right here, the relay station between the spinal cord and the brain, the brain stem and the, and the cortex, cerebral cortex. Globus pallidi, very, uh, very uh, metabolically active. Okay, I just want you to see this baseline. So here's the next picture. It's going to be what happens after taking opioids. So here it is after opioids. Pop, pop. Pop, pop. Two, uh, so pop, pop, those are stroke, right and left. Bilateral symmetric. As soon as I see bilateral symmetric, I think toxic metabolic. Okay, typical hypertension stroke is not going to be bilateral symmetric. And this is a bad place to have a stroke. Number one, you have the risk of neurologic injury of the cortical spinal tract when it's more posterior. Number two is you can involve the, hippo, the thalamus bilateral. This, this same red dot could be more posterior, and bilateral thalamic stroke will cause dementia. You could be demented like that. Um, I've seen a couple of cases of this not that long ago, both patients demented from these bilateral basal ganglia strokes due to uh, opioid abuse. Um, you know, it can cause opioid patients, sometimes they pass out, their blood pressure drops, they're not, it also causes respiratory depression, so they're not getting enough oxygen in their blood, so simultaneous, drop in blood pressure, drop in oxygen supply to the brain stroke you know these are very hyperactive neurons same thing with the hippocampus in the memory center they get trashed real easy patients demented so all it takes is one episode and here's another thing i just want to show you one other type of uh, stroke associated with uh opioid abuse and especially heroin for this one the other one you know opioids in general this one heroin in particular this is the brain way up high above the lateral ventricles and this is shaped kind of like an oval, so it's called semi-ovale, and it's in the center, the deep white matter in the center. Deep white matter means where the myelinated fibers are in comparison with the periphery of the cortex, means like bark in a of a tree in Latin in the periphery. Okay, so that's the gray matter, the gray matter ribbon, also called the cerebral cortex. So anyways, this is deep white matter. This is what it should look like. It's made out of fat myelinating around the neurons, oligodendrocytes, which accelerates conduction. Okay, so here's what happens. Uh, all this red stuff is all stroked out brain. They call it a heroin, leuco meaning white matter, encephalo meaning brain, pathy meaning disease. So heroin, leucoencephalopathy. And this comes from, you know, sort of smoking heroin, inhaling heroin, chasing the dragon, it's also called. Uh, these are the frontal lobe of the brain, parietal lobe. Anyways, giant areas of brain, just trash. Patient's cognitive function drops like a, a man, it's bad. Okay, so... So, you know, people can say, well, gee, isn't it boring to be a low-fat vegan nerd who doesn't take any medications? No, it's not. I'm very happy with it. And here's another quote, how I feel about the healthy lifestyle. This is from John Milton's Paradise Lost as well. Freely we serve because freely we love. <laughs>